These are questions asked by students at Western Washington University in spring 2020 regarding the uh, reading that we're doing in our seminar and deconstruction. And in this case, partic particularly related to intersections of the thought of Derrida and Freud uh, after a reading of Freud's Totem and Taboo. So we're going to go right into this question. Um, but uh, first, uh, a more general question that uh, arose that I would like to just briefly uh, address and respond to. And I'll note, you know, there, there were a lot of questions that came up and I, you know, unfortunately I could only choose a few of them. Otherwise, the, the, the response would be far too long. And um, also I would say that we're going to be uh, addressing some of these questions later. Some of the, some of the questions that that are raised are will be uh, already will be responded to in some of the lectures that are are coming up. So the questions anticipated what's coming. So I'll try to keep our responses really you know brief today, um, as brief as possible. Um, and so, but here was one uh, interesting response regarding the uh, reception of Derrida, the, the, the hostile reception in, in the case of Chomsky and Peterson. Let me just read the student response. I can understand why Derrida's ideas might provoke strong reactions from other philosophers who study his texts and are in conversation with them. While I personally identify the most within his ideas, the most uh, out of all the concepts and ideas, I have studied so far in the class, that is Derrida as opposed to other uh, thinkers we've read, I'm assuming. I understand why those ideas and concepts are a source of arguments for others. Although I still can't go uh, so far as to understand why Peterson would call uh, Derrida a, kind of an evil joker. Perhaps I need to read Peterson to understand that. Uh, Chomsky belittles Derrida's writing by calling it gibberish, which I think is, a, it is closer to fair than to claim that Derrida carries malicious intent in his writing. He does use a lot of contradictory language when uh, discussing his concepts, but if you pay attention thoroughly to the method and structure of his writing, it is far from gibberish in my opinion. That is why I believe that Derrida's Ear of the Other is such a wonderful text Instead of limiting his writing to the written word that he has put down on the page, we get to read him in conversation with others. I think his ideas might uh, be best read in a conversation. Okay, so let me just briefly uh, respond to that. We've addressed the question of Chomsky and Peterson's hostile reception to Derrida uh, previously, so I don't want to say too much more about that, um, except I think, it, I think it really is a good idea to... Um, to read some of these interviews and some of these more informal texts that Derrida has written, the more conversational interventions, particularly when you're when you're first trying to gain access to his thinking, and that's that's true of, of other thinkers as well, such as such as Foucault, and so um, it's not a, it's not a bad uh, strategy, not a bad way to begin getting access to his ideas, and I would say to you that that's a better approach than say reading uh, a paraphrase by some somebody else uh it's 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 better to go directly to the text of derrida and and yeah those those more conversational uh discussions are are when he i think uh there, there are many really interesting insights that come up in those uh, occasions um now um uh, I think, uh, again, I'll just say again very uh, quickly that, yeah, I think, you know, in the case of, of Peterson, he simply didn't, hasn't read Derrida. He's using him, he's creating a Derrida of his own uh, imagination for uh, uh, political purposes to advance his agenda. Doesn't really have much, his, his re, uh, response to Derrida, he's, he's created a Derrida of his own making. Um, now, in the case of, of uh, this claim to, to Derrida writing uh, gibberish, um, well, look, you know, Derrida is not easy to understand. And I think that it's a perfectly uh, legitimate response to say, look, you know, I'm, <laughs> I only have so many uh, uh, days out of the week, so many, you know, weeks out of the year, hours in the day and so on. And I, I just don't have time to... Uh, to read Derrida, I don't have time to unpack this uh, this dense and, and complex uh, thinking. And I think that's that's a, that's a perfectly uh, legitimate response. You know, we all are uh, we all only have so many things that we can uh, do, and, and Derrida is not uh, for everybody. Um, but uh, 
I think though one thing I would just you know be my, a cautionary note here is that um, you know uh, it's it's uh, it's 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 the, the the thing that I'm uncomfortable with personally uh, in this kind of you know claim that Derrida's writing is gibberish is that is that implied in that claim often is the assumption that if I myself can't understand it then therefore it doesn't make sense okay or if I don't want to do the work to understand it then I'm it's easier for me just to say it's gibberish it doesn't make sense and I and I think I would just say look you know let's let's be a little bit more humble uh you know it, there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, you know, I don't, I don't understand this. I don't, I don't get it. Uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. And so I'm going to reserve judgment uh, on it. It doesn't mean that I'm not, I'm, I'm intellectually deficient. It doesn't mean I'm not an intelligent person. Uh, you know, we can't all understand everything. We all have our, our uh, limitations. Uh, and so um, I, you know, I, I think what I would like to see from figures like uh, Peterson and Chomsky and many others out there, I, th th these are emblematic figures because, uh, of, of theory bashing, but there's a lot of theory bashers out there. And I think, you know, why not just say, I, I don't get this. I, I don't understand this. And, and uh, I don't have time to do the work that it's going to require me to do this. So I'm just going to say nothing about something that I don't understand rather than to make authoritative judgments uh, uh, about something that I don't understand. That, that, that is just to me, that's, that's uh, uh, arrogance. Okay. So, all right, let's, but let's go on now here, here uh, um, we find, I, I, I tried to cluster these questions that, that students raised uh, in, um, uh, in, in that the, they're not all the same, the questions, but they're 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 circulating around the same you know issues and questions, and particularly we're interested here in the Freud Derrida uh, nexus. So let's take a little time and reflect upon that. Um, here's one: I did not spend much time in my written response considering the connections between totem and taboo and Derrida. If you could possibly discuss some of that or present some other students' work on that subject, I would find that uh, interesting. Okay, and then here's another student wrote, when you were talking about the ordeal of undecidability in Derrida's Spectres of Marx, you mentioned that the act of making a decision is akin to making a cut. How related is this concept to Freud's theory of name giving being uh, like a cut? Okay, this is a really good question and um, I want to uh, spend a little time uh, working on this. Of course, uh, we're going to be uh, coming this w w there's going to be more discussion of this question of the ordeal of undecidability in uh, specters of Marx in coming lectures. So I'll only talk about it, uh, not in relation to specters of Marx, because there's already going to be material on that coming up. Uh, but then th there was another there, I'm going to just go through another a couple of questions here that you can see there are related. And I'll try to respond to them in, in a cluster. Um, and this is a related concept about, you know, with respect to the question of the proper name. Uh, Freud is arguing that there's an innate nature to the aversion uh, to incest. It is uh, it is similar to the innateness of the logos, not so much to the proper name, because that is something inscribed on a person. It carries a similar innateness like a universal grammar because Chomsky describes that as biological. These are all things humans are argued to be born with. Could we argue that someone is born uh, with a name? To be given a name is unavoidable. Okay, so let me, let me, uh, let me start by responding to this question and then we'll work back to the, to the question that came uh, before that. Okay, so um, first of all, um, it is true in uh, in in both Moses and monotheism, and in to and in uh, totem and taboo. Well, well, particularly in Moses and monotheism, this this is where Freud, you know, develops this even more uh, when, when he starts making you know question when he starts discussing questions of um, uh, of phylogenetic transmission now. The context again is that what what Freud is saying. Just just to back up and, and review very quickly, um, you know, Freud implies in Moses and monotheism that uh, that you know that this this guilt, which he links to the Pauline doctrine of, of original sin. You know, why why are are so many uh, of us you know riveted by this feeling of being you know sort of steeped in uh, in, in in sin. 
even if there's not so ostensibly anything that we've done, you know, wrong, but we still feel guilty. This is, of course, the theme of, you know, Kafka, if you take like, you know, the trial, you know, the whole narrative, uh, you know, he, he doesn't even, he still never finds out what he did, but in the end, he assists his killers in helping them, you know, to, uh, to, to, to kill him. Uh, and so why, you know, is, is the, why, why are we so, uh, uh, why, why do we have this uh, sense of, of guilt, you know? Uh, and, and so, and of course, Freud, you know, links this to the figure of, of Paul and, uh, or, or he says, Paul is the one who, you know, uh, developed a t an entire, you know, theology around it. Uh, but, but, but for Freud, he's going to make this, you know, speculation that there's this primordial event when humanity transitioned from the, uh, uh, from from the time of the father horde to the brother clan, that this left ineradicable traces uh, within you know humanity that that becomes you know transmitted uh, uh, you know genetically, and so the 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 connection that this that the person writing this question is making between say Freud and his phylogenetic theory of of guilt, um, and let's say Chomsky's you know. Uh, claims about, you know, UG being this, uh, you know, a chemical, you know, in, in that's literally in the, uh, in the blood and fluids of the body inscribed in the genome and so on, and thereby transmitted generation. We, we could say the same about uh, uh, Carl Jung as well. And this would link, you know, of course, Peterson as well, since he's, he's a Jungian, that uh, these evolutionary structures that he calls, you know, archetypes of the collective unconscious are also, you know, even in a Darwinian sense, become to be, you know, passed down generationally as a matter of our very biological, uh, you know, nature. Well, all right. Um, all, all of these, what one of the things that all of these thinkings have in common is that they're all speculative. They're all speculative uh, theories of uh, uh, genetic transmission. There's no evidence to suggest that any of them are, uh, are are true there's there's really no way as hypotheses there's no way to uh to prove any of them i mean you can you can believe them or you or you cannot believe it and i and i think so what i but i would what i would say in the case of, of freud is that uh this is not the, the this is why i said previously in the lecture that he was this is freud you know this book moses and monotheism was published right before he, he died. It was the last thing that he wrote. This was something, the speculation that he throws out later in his life. I, I don't think it's, in my reading, it's not Freud at his finest uh, moment. I mean, the, the Freud that has proven to be so uh, influential for, for so many is, is, is the Freud who thought of himself as a kind of an empirical uh, scientist who's trying to understand you know theories of sexuality and human development uh, without recourse to uh you know to speculative notions you know like um phylogenetic transmission or transcendental uh ide ideals uh, of any sort and so it's true that this is in the thinking of freud but it's not um you know it's 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 not uh, representative of of the larger corpus of of Freud's uh, writings, it's something that comes in light. And many many of his, uh, uh, you know, those who responded to him, particularly you know, Jew his his uh, Jewish, uh, you know, readers, sort of really you know, uh, jumped on this and saw this as as some sort of you know, um, re Freud somehow reclaiming uh, his own, you know, Jewish identity as a matter of, of, of something that's literally a question, you know, of the blood. Uh, and I, I, I would, I would just, I don't think that's, um, it's not the Freud that, that, that appeals to, to me anyway. And I, and I don't think that it's, um, um, it, it is fair to, to make this observation, but it's, again, it's not characteristic of Freud's writing, particularly on the question of the proper name as, as it comes down to a say in, uh, Totem and Taboo, in which the the the, the naming the the the, uh, the process of naming that he's describing is is far more akin to the Saussurean notion of doctrine of the arbitrary uh, sign. You know, that's something that comes to us uh, externally and in an arbitrary and, and violent way. Now, uh, to say, well, well, why not? What what's wrong with saying that there is a proper name that that the, that that my that my name that the name that I bear is a representation of some 
kind of uh, you know structure on the human interior, whether we talk about it in biological terms or transcendental idealist terms. Um, you know, we all feel, I think, that we, we you know we want to to believe that 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 the name that I bear is is a representation of something that is irreducible uh, within me, and. Um, uh, the, you know, this is the idea of ipsity or, you know, the, 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 we could put it in Cartesian terms, you know, the, the, the soul, that there's some, you know, we, we, we've, we've spoken of this with respect to the question of the kernel and Derrida, there's some irreducible structure, some me that is me, and my proper name is a representation of that. Okay, well, I, again, and I, I'm not here to tell you or to preach to you or to convert you to a, a, the, the correct way of thinking about this. Our goal simply is to try to uh, determine how these think, thinkers that we're studying um, approach these questions. And we're trying to understand, in this case, the thought of Derrida. Okay, so let me let me give you one uh, a, a example of, of how we might approach this. When, when you read uh, Spectres of Marx at the beginning of this text, he dedicates the lecture to Chris Haney. Now, Chris Haney was uh, a socialist, a Marxist who was associated with African National Congress, ANC in South Africa. And uh, even as apartheid came to an end, you know, he, 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 he let's say, militated on behalf of, of a class conscious uh, economic politics that was indeed, you know, Marxist. And uh, and he was killed. He was he was assassinated. And so and it was shortly before Derrida gave his talk at the Spectres of Marx conference. And so he dedicates Spectres of Marx uh, conference, uh, excuse me, a paper that he gave, and then the book uh, itself to Chris Haney. And he and he notes that. And I would just, as you're reading that text, look very carefully at that in, uh, inscription early in the text or that dedication, and you're going to see he says that, that a proper name you know, re represents, it, it's always something, it's not, you know, just a proper name. There's all, it, it, it's a representation of something that is irreducible uh, about, you know, the other. And we don't want to just, we don't want to uh, just, you know, dismiss this idea that there is something that is, you know, um, ir irreducible, you know, about the other. And, uh, and, and in terms of what we might be thinking of as, as ipsity. Okay, so, but but the question is, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, what, what when Derrida speaks of, say, the visor effect and, and the, as a kind of a veil that drops, uh, uh, from, uh, even the eyelids being, you know, a, also a kind of a veil that, that, that uh, close upon, you know, the essence, uh, you know, of the other, the, the irreducible, the kernel of the other, whatever that is. Um, it, it's not even really that essential to, to uh, make the case that Derrida is saying that there is no there there to put it in uh, starkly uh, metaphysical terms. Uh, he does say, as as we've discussed in um, Ear of the Other, he does say that the, that the desire for what he's calling the the irreducible kernel, uh, what, what what's what's uh, uh, ne necessary as a matter of a non key or or necessity is that we cannot not want there to be this irreducible. Uh, a kernel that is definitive of, of who we are, uh, the the other who we are, what what makes us who we are. Um, uh, but um, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, and I, and Spivak makes this point. Other theorists have made the same you know point that this debate between Derrida and Heidegger regarding this the 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 intact uh, kernel, it's not really essential that we make any kind of determination. Uh, about that uh, at all, really, because in, in effect, the, the this current, this irreducible kernel, if it is there, if it's not there, uh, it's still, you know, hidden from us. And I think this, this is the point. It's, um, you know, it, so in, in regard, with regard to this question of the proper name. So if, if there is, you know, the, the, a name that, that, that I bear within me that is uh, truly representative of my, you know, ipsity or, or my, of the kernel that, that, that is definitive of, of the I that I am, um, it's not uh, available to us. And I think that's, that's really uh, the point. You know, one can believe, you know, one can uh, affirm that I do have, that there is something, uh, you know, that I have an irreducible essence, this me that is me. Um, uh, but, uh, 
you know, it's it's not something that positions itself in an empirical sense in, in the framework of, of knowledge so that we can uh, definitively say, you know, what that is, is. Okay, so this is this is a very Kantian idea. You know, Kant says the same thing about, you know, Descartes when he very famously says, I had to do away with not uh, with um, uh, with. Uh, you know, with with knowledge to make room for faith. I mean, we we can believe. I mean, one can believe, but 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 believing is is not the same thing as saying that there is a there there. Okay, and so if we think of this in relation to Chomsky and idea of universal grammar, the claim that this UG is there is not a uh, or this sort of in, this primordial inscription that is encoded in my genome it, it's not a uh, it's not a claim to to faith in, in a deridian sense he called chomsky says we have unconscious knowledge of this now that's obviously a deconstructible uh, binary if i have unconscious knowledge that's knowledge that's not knowledge all right so what what chomsky is calling unconscious knowledge um, I, I think, you know, we, we could, uh, it's, it's simply a matter of faith. I mean, this is what we've traditionally have called uh, the, you know, reference to these kinds of, you know, whether they're metaphysical structures or, you know, centers of, of our being in, a, in, a, in any sort of spiritual sense. Uh, faith is not the same thing as knowledge. And so I can, I can you know, I, I, I can't know it. Right. And even if I, if I call it, if I say that I have unconscious knowledge of it, it's still, it's not knowledge and it's like what Donald Rumsfeld what did he call the uh he goes there are known knowns and unknown knowns I mean what this is what Chomsky is saying about UG it's an unknown known well an unknown known is just something that we we, we believe in and I think that's that's really the point and so 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 you know uh it's not a matter of of uh of eliminating our uh our our beliefs it's a matter of though of understanding that what what we uh well, we, we can believe in something, but believing in something does is not a matter of, of knowing with, let's say, Cartesian certainty that that there is is in fact there. OK, well, let's let's let me let me go back here for just a minute uh, to I'm going to go back to this question here. Uh, and I think this is this is a short, brief question, but it's it's a good question. And uh, maybe we can uh, work a bit with this. And I think it might help us to understand uh, in a little bit deeper way, what we're talking about, that the act of making a decision is akin to making a cut. How related is this concept to Freud's theory of name giving being like a cut? Okay, so I want to uh, let, let's work on this. And I and I think I'm going to uh, let's let's talk about this with respect to the Abrahamic, which is an important you know, concept that is in um, you know, specters of Marx. But, it, you know, Derrida has many other texts where he uh, uh, discusses these uh, notions, and it's certainly in uh, the thought of Freud. And this is a place where I think the the thinking of Freud and Derrida dovetail dovetails together, you know, quite uh, you know nicely. Okay, so but but let's put it in very. Let, let's start with thinking of it. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try again because I'm trying to be brief here and uh, concise, uh, and, and because there's so much that one could say, but I think I want to use, uh, let me use an Abrahamic figure that might help us understand this. Particularly, we'll talk about it with respect to, to uh, how this is interpreted in, in the Pauline tradition, okay? So, and uh, as we've already said, in, in the case of the Abrahamic, that, these, that the covenant in the Abrahamic tradition is uh, it, it's a, it's an, it's an, a matter of a relationship. I think of a social contract, an agreement that one enters into with the other. Okay, so covenants are about promises that I make to the other. Now, the, in the case of the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham and God enter into a covenant. All right, so that means that they enter into a relationship uh, with one another, and that's that's what it's all about. And so when uh, it's about, again, my relation to the other, all right, which is, is the essence of, of the sort of the ethics of deconstruction, how I relate to the other, okay? And so Abraham and God enter into a covenant. They enter into a relationship. Now in this relationship, God tells Abraham to circumcise himself, to circumcise Isaac and Ishmael and all the male, uh, you know, uh, males that are associated, you know, with him. 
which which he in, uh, in fact you know does okay now i'm going to be very uh graphic here uh because i think you know freud is is a theorist of sexuality and i but, but graphic in a in an anthropological sense to help us understand this okay so we think we're talking we've been talking about the kernel we've been talking about deconstruction in a nutshell all right so when we think of the act of circumcision we can say well what what happens in the act of circumcision so the the the, the male penis that uh, has the foreskin removed from it, as, we, as we've said, it's the foreskin is cut off of the top of, of the penis and, and the foreskin is taken and it's, as we said, it's rolled into a ring and the ring is, is preserved. Uh, and, and the ring, like, like, like in the case, let's say, of uh, West Africa today, in many, in many uh, contexts, North, Northwest Africa uh, and throughout history and uh, in, in the Judaic tradition, the Islamic tradition, Sephardic, uh, Jewish, the Mishram uh, tradition, the, 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 circum the, the ring is preserved until the child um, gets married, the boy gets married, and then he presents the ring, you know, to his, uh, you know, to, to his wife on his wedding day. And, and we've said, you know, that the, 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 uh, that the, that the custom of exchanging rings, you know, is a very old custom indeed. And it is, in fact, linked to uh, circumcision. We said that the ring is also a symbol of, of the promise because it's, it's again, it's a circular, the sort of, sort of the, the vow saying the yes, you know, in the Nietzschean sense, we can talk about this in terms of the doctrine of the eternal return. In the Abrahamic tradition, we can think of this in terms of the promise. The, the circling around back to the uh, to, to, to reaffirm the vow that's made because again as we said the idea of promise keeping is very different from a Cartesian idea of a, sp a more spatial idea of truth as competence or correct perception um, here truth is always a matter of something that is deferred it's it, it's, it's it's always put off and so so the uh, the vow has to be reaffirmed. The yes has to the yes today has to be said tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and so on. Okay, so we've we've discussed that. All right, so um, so so uh, it, it's the the cut though too, as Nietzsche said, points out in uh, Genealogy of Morals, that the cut serves as a mnemonic device as well, which is to say, it, it's it's a trauma a, a trauma that helps the those who are cut to remember the promise that they've made. And so we're thinking, you know, in anthropological terms, uh, you know, let's say prior to the advent of, um, you know, of, of uh, alphabetic literacy, even of, of, of scriptural literacy, this would be like, if we could return to the image of Thoth, who's, who, who cuts the dice, who, who, who makes the mark, okay? So it's, 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 a, it's a mark making in the flesh of the other. And so the father cuts off the foreskin of the penis, uh, of the child, and so it's it's a signature, just like a contract. You sign your name on the contract. The the, the father is signing his name on the contract of, uh, you know, of the, uh, signing his name on the body of the child to affirm the contract or the covenant that he's establishing with the child, and saying, "Yes, I recognize you. You are my uh, son, uh, and and you are henceforth accorded all of the promises." that uh, come with that um, identity, okay? Now, I give you, let me give you an example in, in Islamic culture as well. You could think of like every uh, surah in the Quran begins, you know, with the Bismillah, which is the Ba, uh, uh, which, which the first letter is, is the Ba. Now, the Ba in, in Arabic, it, it kind of looks like a U, uh, the shape of a U, but there's a dot underneath it. And it's, it's said in, in many Sufi traditions that all of the Quran is contained within the dot underneath the ba of of the bismillah which is which is again again it's the it's that mark just think of it just like the dice with uh within the case of thoth and so and so the mark does two things it it's it joins and it divides okay so this is again we talk about the the trait de union or the trace of the union this is a uh the, the mark when abraham cuts isaac and ishmael he links them together but it also divides them uh as well so it's it's a cut that marks says it's it's a sign of the covenant cut mark uh, uh the name of the father's being inscribed and and so uh abraham uh, gives the same name to both you know he gives his name uh, to both isaac and ishmael they both have that name they're both joined together but they're also uh divided okay and so so the cutting is a naming and so in the case of say specters of marks we can think of you know 
you know, uh, the the ordeal of undecidability that Hamlet goes through. Uh, find it, but finally he makes the decision that is the incision and he makes the uh, inscription. So we could think of this in very, frankly, uh, uh, Saussurian terms. I don't know. You think of it in terms of, again, uh, of, of the, the question of paternity. And we said that, you know, and we're going to address this more in a moment about maternity being, you know, something that that uh, traditionally has been viewed as something that, that um, we can we can see it with our eyes. Uh, the, the the child leaving the body of the mother, so maternity has traditionally been con, uh, been construed as something that is natural, whereas paternity is is a matter of of discursive, uh, you know, construction or construction and discourse. So the father has to say, well, um, you know, I accept that this child is is my child. Now maybe you know who knows, uh, uh, like like in the case, let's say of of, of many. Uh, Ethnic groups, let's say in in uh, in, Af in West Africa, traditionally, um, the like if you take the case of the Songhe, the um, uh, it's it's the it's it's the child. The, like if I if I you know if, if one wants to hand down one's baraka or or, or nyama or uh, gifts, wants to bestow it upon the next generation, the father doesn't give his blessing or his birthright the, the birthright to his own son, he gives it to the uh, the oldest son of his sister, okay? Because why? Because the sister, he knows that the sister is his blood, you know, relative. In the case of his own son, again, we're thinking, you know, before, you know, uh, blood tests, genetic testing, and so on, he, he can't really be completely sure. I mean, he can hope that it's his own child, you know, but, but one can never be completely sure. Like, like we think of this again, we're thinking this in, in, in anthropological terms. So the moment when the father, you know, goes through that, uh, that, uh, you know, ordeal of undecidability, at some point he makes a decision and then Derrida is going to say all decisions are, are made in madness. But finally, because there's no, it's, he, he can't know. He has no car. There's no way that he can know for sure, unless he's like locked his uh, wife into a tower. And that's happened though, obviously, but, but he, uh, you know, he, he makes the decision. And so he says, okay, you're mine. And so you get everything that's coming to you uh, as, as a consequence of that. So it's a covenant that is established. Okay. So I hope that is, is, that is clear. Okay. Now let's think about this in, uh, in Pauline terms. Now, now Paul, the apostle Paul is the one who is, is the apostle for the Gentile world. And remember in the history of, of, of the Greco Roman world, circumcision was not normally, uh, you know, practice. And you can go, like, if you go to the Louvre in Paris, you see all the big statues of, of you know, the, of, from uh, ancient, you know, Greece that are there and other museums of the world. You'll see that all of the males are not circumcised. And so for Christianity to, uh, to, to, to spread and, and the non-African uh, uh, Arab uh, world, the, not in the Middle East, not in uh, Africa, but in, in, in the, in the Greco-Roman world, you know, uh, it was circumcision. Let's put it this way: it was a hard sell. All right, and so Paul developed this, you know, view. And he, Paul, was as as a, as a Jewish man. He said, "Well, look, you know, circumcision has there are good things about it, uh, but at the same time, you know, he said, uh, you know, it's it's not absolutely essential. And so this this idea of of the you know he goes because what is he said? Well, what is essential is what he calls circumcision of the heart. So we can think of literal circumcision and then circumcision of the heart. So we know that in the Christian tradition, circumcision is replaced with uh, with baptism, with the sprinkling of, of the water, which is also a christening or a naming ceremony in the same way that in Judaism and in Islam, circumcision is is a, a naming as well, the, the, re the receiving of the name of, of, of the Father, um, which is also, again, in Lacanian sense, the nom de père is the nom de père. The name of the Father is the no of the Father because it includes it, it implies a prohibition, you know, prohibitions that are placed upon the child as well, because the covenant doesn't just bind the father to the child. It binds, it binds the child to the father and the law of the father. Okay. So now, but if we think, let's, let's think about this idea of, of figurative circumcision or what Paul's calling circumcision of the heart. He's going to say, you know, uh, circumcision on the fleshly tablets of, of the human heart. Okay. Um, all right, so we know that's a figure of speech because a, a child can be literally circumcised, as, as in just literally being cut and traumatized, 
Uh, but when we think of circumcision of the heart, there's no actual circumcision that takes place, right? I mean, it's you don't uh, open up someone's chest, pull out the heart, you know, cut the top uh, top off of it. It's 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 a figure of speech. It's 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 a uh, you know figurative. All right, uh, but it's but it's a very provocative figure. Okay, so let's think again about we've been talking about this idea of the intact kernel. Okay deconstruction in a nutshell all right so we can think of of this uh of a kernel we can think of the the penis as having like let's say the head of the penis as being like a kernel right and so the kernel is is like a, a hard nut that has to be cracked open so that you can get to the soft uh, uh, uh nut inside of that uh, hard shell all right think of like a, like a chestnut like chestnuts roasting on an open fire right well you cook the chestnuts on the fire and the and the shell is very hard and then you open you crack it open and it's this really soft shell inside and so part of it is 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 linked to this idea of well okay so we could think of there's a kernel that that i bear within me this is of course a figure of speech right but but there's but the internal kernel is, is again, it's akin to the idea of the external kernel in which the shell is removed. Uh, literally the head of the, the penis, the foreskin of the penis is removed. But so now you have an, an interior kernel. We've been talking about the intact kernel, right? Uh, and so the, 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 the shell is broken and it's opened up. And in that way, and in that way, the the uh, the person, you know, what what Paul's calling circumcision of the heart, then is about you know the relationship with with God. All right, so we can think of well, actual circumcision, literal circumcision, is about my relation to the other. Uh, this more figurative notion of circumcision is also about my relation to the other, but we're talking in this case about the absolute other. All right, so there's the absolute other, which we could think of as, as the divine other, God, and then there's the actual other. But the figure, you know, uh, works in, in, in both uh, ways, all right? And so, um, but again, these are obviously, uh, you know, actual circumcision is, is something that is empirical. Uh, circumcision of the heart is, is metaphorical. It's, 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 it's a spiritual matter. It's a way of it's a way of thinking about our relationship with with God. So what Paul's you know what Paul's basically saying is you know uh, what's really essential is that you are entered that you've entered into a relationship with God and that and that God has uh, like that your actual Father who circumcised you, God has uh, circumcised you as well, or He's He's inscribed His name upon you in the same way that the Father has inscribed His name upon you and so now you're able to enter into a relationship with god in the same way that you enter into a relationship with your actual father the father in heaven you have a relationship with that father and then you have the uh, relationship with the actual father okay so you say well let's we're talking again about the proper name well what's wrong with saying that there's a proper name that i bear uh, within me well may, maybe there isn't anything wrong with it it's just that it's again it's it's a matter of, of faith it's a, it would be something that one would believe in a religious sense uh, but it's not a matter it's not an empirical matter all right and so that that's the point i'd like to make now i hope i haven't uh, and i want to belabor it uh but i i hope that gives you some sense of of uh of this and and I you know um, I'm going to go on to the next question because I you know, but what, this next question I think we can carry through um, with respect to what we've already uh, discussed here so let but, so let's look at the next question we'll think it in relation to what we've just talked about here's a question I have a quote here that you gave us where he Derrida says it is because I am not one with myself that I can speak with the other and address the other. That is the only way for me to take responsibility and make uh, decisions. As someone who frequently feels not one with himself or not one generally, this practically leapt off the page, but I also have certain questions. I understand the related discussion of the other as irrevocably other, relation without relation for Levinas, and how that absolute inaccessibility predicates a lot of our ethical our responsibilities, but it's less clear to me how that irrevocable otherness also makes its way into the self and why that feeling of otherness from oneself, disassociation, depersonalization, whatever, enables us to speak with the other and uh, address the other. Doesn't our speaking with the other require us to inhabit ourselves 
as fully as possible? Or is it instead that our speaking with the other requires us to recognize that they, like us, are somehow estranged from themselves? Is this the root of responsibility? How? He says, disassociation is the condition of community. Why? I understand and very much agree with the ways disassociation problematizes identity and makes identity politics so seductive, what I wouldn't give for a coherent identity, but I don't see clearly how the relation to the self emanates or necessitates the relation to the other. If that relation to the other is Levinas's justice, is there an analogous term for the relation uh, to the self? Okay, now I have a sign here and I want, we, can, we can develop this, but Again, our, our goal here, I, we're not here to, I'm not here to tell you what is the truth or what is the correct way to think about any of these matters um, in terms of how one applies them to one's own you know, personal uh, life or approach to the study of literature. We're, we're, we're simply trying to understand uh, Derrida and, and what, what he's actually saying. And, and Derrida has uh, been obviously influenced by uh, Saussure in this regard. Okay, so... Um, if we think of, uh, we want to think of the um, um, this matter of disassociation and my, you know, relation to the other. The point is, is that okay? So if, if I'm given a name, uh, and that name is, you know, the question is, is that name that I have a a a, a, a the proper name that I bear a representation of this essential? Uh, you know, metaphysical ground that I, you know, that is a part of my, you know, soul, if I, or my psyche, to put it in, in stark, you know, metaphysical terms, or is it completely uh, arbitrary? Okay. Now, uh, okay. So let let's think about this. Now, this is also a very uh, Nietzschean idea as well. But but here's the point: is that that the that the proper name uh, is, you know, say for Nietzsche and for Derrida, that, that, that my relationship with, let's say with my body, that the proper name, it's, it's, it's a metaphorical relationship. So I have a name and that name is, you know, uh, rep represents me. Um, but it's not me, right? It, 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 it exists empirically. It exists externally and it's given to me by, uh, the other. Now, if it's the right name, that would imply, if it's the correct representation of my proper name, that would imply that the other somehow was able to ascertain or fathom what that, you know, name that I, I, I bear stamped within me on the human interior would give me that name and it would be, you know, the right name or, or, or le mot uh, juste. Okay. And again, one, one can believe that, uh, but, but what Derrida is, is suggesting, you know, following say Saussure and Nietzsche in this regard is, to, and also Lacan, this is very, this is a standard, you know, feature of a lot of, you know, contemporary uh, continental theory, particularly coming out of France, is that, um, that the name, once I'm given the name, this is why I said earlier that I had heard Derrida say in a lecture, the most violent thing you can do to a child is give it a name. I think that was a very, for me, that was a kind of almost like a, a moment of epiphany when I heard him say that years ago. But because, because the name, when you give the child a name, you, you, you insert the child into what, say, Lacan's going to call the symbolic or into, uh, in, into, uh, you know, in, into discourse. And that, that name is thereby going to determine who I am. Uh, for the rest of, of my uh, life. It, 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 it includes you know, like my national identity, my familial identity, all of the, the legal uh, rights and responsibilities that I have coming to me by virtue of the fact that I've given a, I've been given a particular name that thereby inserts me into a, into a, the realm of the symbolic, okay, or into some sort of symbolic discourse. Okay, now, now one, of the, one of the things that is important to understand about deconstruction, I think this is a really important point I would like you to, 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 to bear in mind and to remember this, is that for, for deconstructive thinkers like Derrida, Truth does not, you know, disclose itself um, as, as, as something that is self, you know, evident, like in the say, for instance, like when Parmenides goes to the shrine of, uh, you know, the goddess and Alethea, you know, uh, uh, discloses herself or becomes so un unconcealed, you know, that, that what, is, what, what is hidden or concealed becomes unconcealed. Um, it, it's, it's not, um, um, truth doesn't, disclose itself for Derrida as such in these ways. And if it did, it would be uh, akin to what, you know, what, what, what one might call, you know, the event, you know, with, with a capital 
E. Now, one can uh, we can think of one can anticipate the event of of, of truth's disclosure that this if if this were to happen, this is also you know linked to the idea of messianicity, but its its actual disclosure is something that for Derrida is is uh, deferred, and so what the way that then that we know things is negatively. We can only know things negatively. We know something because of what it's not, and so another way to say this with respect to the question of the proper name. Is that is that your identity is determined not on the basis of of, of you know it's you know uh, the fact that, that your name refers to this um, uh, you know what, whatever this you know whatever this ipsity or kernel is that you is you know it's it's rather a matter of how it functions differentially in systems of signification. Okay, now this is this you know this course that we're doing this quarter, this seminar that we're working on. You know, uh, it, the, the, we're looking at deconstruction, but I chose deliberately to make this course one more focused on questions of politics, to think particularly around, about uh, the praxis of deconstruction and intersections of deconstruction and Marxism. It would take an entire other seminar to focus on, let's say, questions of deconstruction, its relation to structuralism and questions of, of linguistics. So we can only touch upon these things very uh, rapidly and in passing, but I, I would say this is, 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 you know, one of the common metaphors that's often used to think about, you know, these more sort of structuralist, uh, post-structuralist ways of thinking about, you know, discourse is that, you know, language is, 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 it's social through and through, and it's akin to a kind of a game that I play with the other that has, you know, rules to it. So you think of this metaphor of the game, like, like, like the, 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 the metaphor of the chess match is often you know used but I'll just use this very you know briefly here we can think of like for instance if you think of a, a chess board um, that has various pieces on it, like a king a knight a rook you know pawns and so on that if you want to know what what uh, if you think of the functioning of that uh, of the pieces on that board that like a, a king if you, if you want to know how to play chess for instance you say well what what does the king do on a chess board you know you don't go out and and read you know biographies of, of uh, Henry VIII, or, 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 or you know, watch Shakespeare's plays about you know the various you know kings that he writes plays about in the history of England, or study you know the Sun King in France. I mean, all of that is is irrelevant. Um, the, the 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 importance of that piece is is determined by its relation to other pieces on that uh, you know on that chessboard. So you can think I, I throw that out as a way to sort of think about how your name functions differentially, how it's difference that determines the meaning of your name. It's not the identity of, of the proper name with what it represents. It's how it functions, you know, relationally in systems of signification for Derrida. So this is again, differing and deferring. Uh, we only know things negatively. Truth does not disclose itself to us as such in any sort of uh, metaphysical, uh, you know, way. Um, if you know if if this were to happen uh like let's say we talked about with the case of the epiphany we would gave the example of how at you know christmas time you see all these crashes with the baby jesus in the manger and the light you know glowing because that child is not just a human being that's the god man that child is a god and so it's 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 a moment of of, of truth that's being you know disclosed okay and again the point is not to say that you know Jesus isn't God. You know, if you if you believe that, that's a part of your faith, and that's that's wonderful. You know, but but the but the point is is that that would be a matter of, of belief. In terms of knowledge, however, uh, we we know things differentially. We know things negatively, and so if you want to know, you know, the, the meaning of of let's say a sign in a Saussurian sense, you have to look at it differentially. How it functions in relation to other signs and systems of signification, much like I used the example of the king. On, on the uh, on, on the chessboard, okay, and so okay, I want to uh, and very briefly here. Let's uh, let, let me show you this uh, image here. Um, this is sort of uh, semiotics 101, uh, uh, but uh, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But I'll just say this in passing. And if you're not familiar with this, if you've never encountered this before in your in course previous courses in critical theory, you might want to give it some thought. Um, this is the Saussurian notion of the sign. And you can see here on the right, you see the signifier at the top, the signified at, at the bottom. And the signifier is, is the materiality of the sign. The signified is the middle concept that is associated with the sign. Okay, so um, so uh, for instance, the, the word that I speak, the, the, the uh, 
the wind that the, the sound that that, that uh, issues from my throat when I speak a word it, it has a materiality now now wind breath you can't see it but it exists in an empirical sense uh, similarly if I write something down that is also a matter of the signifier because it has an actual uh, material empirical verifiable materiality to it okay what Saussure calls the signified is the mental concept that is associated you know, with the sign. And for Saussure, they're interchangeable uh, uh, terms. And so this, the sign implies both the signifier and the signified. And a lot of times this idea of the Mobius strip is, is uh, used to uh, illustrate this notion. You can't have the signifier without the signified. Now, again, we can't, we can only say this in passing and very rapidly, but in Derrida's very, you know, famous deconstruction of Saussure, you know, what he observes is that, um, you know, what, what, what Saussure is calling the signified or the mental concept implies, again, a kind of a platonic metaphysics of, you know, of presence. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he, he deconstructs the phonologocentrism of Saussure. Um, because it's, it privileges the idea of somebody who's actually, you know, uh, there. But note that the other point, you know, that Derrida is going to make is that the what Saussure calls the mental, the signified or the mental concept, it, it must be represented with the signifier. And so if you look at signifier above and signified below, they're both, uh, you know, signifiers. And, and so Derrida's point is, is we can't know what a signifier is you know, without the signified, and we can't know the signified without the signifier. And so if we want, when we think of like, well, what is a mental concept um, to, to have any access to a pure mental concept that isn't articulated in discourse, it, it, does, it wouldn't make any sense. This is, again, this notion of there's nothing, you know, outside of the text. There's no way, we have no access to the, to the signified, except insofar as we talk about it with respect to uh, signifiers. Okay, I'll give you. Let me let me give you, uh, again, again an example about this. Let's say this is in the case of you know Chomsky. I'm, again, I'm using Chomsky here, not just to bash Chomsky, but I think it's it's useful uh, comparatively to think about you know what what deconstruction is not. You know, uh, and so if you think of like I'll give you one example. Is that Chomsky once said you know he says in places when he talks about you know the democratic. He says, well, the extent to which our schools inculcate. Uh, uh, democratic rhetoric or democratic, you know, ideology to our students is revelatory of how they're not, in fact, dem uh, democratic. Uh, in other words, uh, the de democracy should not be a matter of, you know, um, of ideological, rhetorical uh, indoctrination. It should be, you know, it implies a more, you know, free uh, thinking, uh, this sort of anarchistic thinking that he uh, embraces. Uh, but but uh, okay, let, 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 let's think about that. I mean, we, we can see that that's certain that there's certainly there's a sense in which that's true. If I authoritatively dictate to you what the terms of the democratic are, uh, then uh, I'm not being democratic myself. I'm being uh, authoritarian. Uh, and so uh, and that's that's true. Um, but uh, it's also true that if I want to understand what the democratic is to begin with, it has to be articulated in discourse. I mean, otherwise I would just, what, what, how, how am I to, like if I want to teach, let's say, you know, children the, the, the virtues of democracy, you know, what do I do? I just tell them, let's all sit in a circle, close our eyes and just, you know, meditate. And then it'll come to us, uh, you know, uh, on our own. We, we can't know what the democratic is unless it's articulated as a matter of discourse, all right? And so this is also, this is something that's totally lacking in Chomsky's thought. We think of like the, the, the Gadamerian idea of, of prejudice, you know, prejudging. You know, we need our prejudices. Uh, we need what that which is already articulated in order to help us understand, you know, um, uh, th thinking thought and a thought or an ideology a, a thought system a philosophical system in, in the first place and so there's no way so again if you think of this in, in terms of Derrida's deconstruction of Saussure there's no way to access uh, the signified without signifiers there would be no way to access what what Chomsky is calling the democratic you know unless it's articulated in uh, in discourse okay now now with regard to Truth only disclosing itself negatively. I'd also use the the example. Um, I'm going to uh, use this in a, in a lecture that's forthcoming on um, 
the, the Levi Strauss idea of the raw and the cook, right? So, uh, like if we if if, if somebody is sitting, uh, you know, in, in nature and they have a uh, let's say a potato, you know, and they say, well, that, that, this is a potato that that's a raw potato as opposed to what Levi Strauss is calling and say a cooked potato. Well, we don't know if someone is sitting in nature, they're not going to say this is a raw. Uh, potato. They only know of the idea of the raw in relation to the idea of, of, of the cook. And this is the same true of nature and culture. You know, uh, is, there, is there a pure experience of nature or do we only know what nature is in relation to culture, which is to say what nature isn't? So again, we only know things, for Derrida anyway, we only know things uh, negatively. And this is very important for understanding his thinking about writing uh, you know, differences between writing and speaking. Uh, we don't know, we can't know what speaking is unless we have writing to, uh, you know, to uh, compare it to. And so, again, we, this is, again, whatever your views are on this and whether you like this or not like this, I mean, our, our goal here is to try to understand Derrida. And so for, and for an understanding of Derrida, we only know things negatively. Truth as such does not disclose itself to us. This is true of, of this intact kernel on the human interior, or, or, or let's also, as we're going to see in a moment, in the case of maternity as well, we, we only know things insofar. We, we don't, I mean, m the maternal, for instance, doesn't disclose itself to us as such. It's, all, it's something that has to be articulated in discourse and in, in, in comparison and difference with other, uh, you know, uh, uh, signs as well. Okay. Again, that was very rapid, but I hope that gives you a, at least an introductory sense of how to uh, begin thinking about these concepts in, in terms of understanding Derrida's thought. Okay, we want to move now. And again, I'm, I'm going quickly here. We've got a lot of questions and I, I, I just I'm worried that the uh, it'll get too out of hand in terms of links. I'm going very uh, rapidly, but I apologize to those of you whose questions I could not uh, include in this particular uh, video. Uh, but uh, so I want to read some uh, representative uh, emblematic, you know, responses to Freud. So uh, particularly with the question to gender and maternity. This sentence in Freud's text infuriated me. In this evolution, Freud says, I am at a loss to indicate the place of the great maternal deities who perhaps uh, everywhere proceeded with paternal deities. Uh, preceded the uh, eternal paternal deities. I couldn't believe the apathy with which Freud cast aside the question of maternal deities. The patriarchal bias of Freud's thought is so overwhelming as to not even warrant a discussion of the matriarch of female spirituality. I thought immediately that it is not that it is only femininity, only womanhood, and the ma and matters of women uh, that could be cast aside so easily without any thought as to how this might weaken the argument of the male psychoanalyst. Okay, so many, many of us are coming to Freud for the first time, and there, there's a vast literature out there about Freud and misogyny and, and, and the feminine. And um, the point is not really to uh, defend Freud. I mean, there are many misogynistic statements that Freud makes, and I think, you know, uh, Freud's thinking of is, is problematic, as, as has been pointed out by, by many others. Uh, and so I won't go over that here, except I would encourage you to look at, you know, figures like um, uh, Sixu, especially with this regard, Helene Sixu. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, Freud uh, and, and Sixu alludes to this in her famous essay on, you know, the Medusa, uh, that, um, you know, Freud's going to call feminine female sexuality, he compares it to what that the sort of a thinking of Africa is that dark you know, continent, sort of 19th century racist thinking of Africa. Uh, but, but I think, you know, one thing that I think just to give Freud, uh, just to cut him a little slack here, is that um, he is saying here is that he, he is admitting that he's at a loss here. It's not so much that he's saying that he doesn't think it's significant. He's saying that he's, he's simply acknowledging in this particular quote anyway, uh, that he he he's he's at a loss to uh, uh, think about this, and he and one of the reasons why you know he he chose a very problematic uh, a figure of speech, obviously when he calls feminine sexuality that dark continent. But but it does it is indicative of a kind of a bafflement that he has when he says when he says it's that dark continent. What he means is that feminine sexuality is 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 very much you know unexplored. Uh, and, uh, and, and really, you know, Freud's thinking is it, it does, um, 
it does center around in many ways around male sexuality. It opens up all kinds of questions, say, for instance, about we think about circumcision um, being, you know, what, what about, you know, uh, FGM, uh, feminine circumcision, you know, uh, uh, feminine, uh, female genital mutilation. I mean, all of these, these are, these are really complex, interesting, difficult questions that, that far exceed what we can do here. But I would encourage you to continue uh, to uh, pursue them. And I would, but I would also be careful about simply, you know, dismissing uh, Freud, because even though Freud, there are problems in Freud's thought, you know, clearly, um, and yet he, his his thinking became the foundation for so many theories of psychoanalysis and gender studies. I mean, I think, for instance, we think of, say, someone like, you know, Judith Butler, it's very hard to imagine that she could have articulated the gender theory that she articulates without her basis, without her, you know, um, being steeped in a kind of a Freudian uh, thinking that, that is that about gender that is empirical, uh, that is not uh, essentialist. So Freud really, you know, long before Derrida, long before Butler, you know, thought about gender as being something that is empirical and, and externally uh, shaped and determined desire as well, rather than being, you know, natural in any sort of Aristotelian uh, essentialist sense. And so he's, he's not a thinker we want. I mean, we, we need to point out the problems with him when they exist. But I think we also, um, you know, don't want to, as, as the old saying goes, throw out the baby with the uh, dirty uh, bathwater. Okay. Here's another uh, quote. I think Freud is completely missing the point of the relationship of spirit to body and gender to sexuality. From what I know, all these are intertwined with each other to form in the body. There is no sense of feminine or masculine in, in, in the gen, genity, excuse me, because gender is a uh, fluidity like water. It seems like this reading is the first of the work on colonizing gender and sexuality. That is my thought. I am not sure how far I am from the truth. Um, yeah, again, um, you know, Freud provides, a, 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 I think, you know, the, a, a foundational basis for thinking about, you know, gender in a performative fashion. And so I don't, I mean, I, I would be careful about being, um, you know, preemptorily uh, negating his thought. I mean, if Freud comes, one, there's a lot of reasons why one might be repulsed with the thinking of Freud or want to uh, resist it. But I would, I would do my best to uh, resist those uh, impulses. And the same is true, again, of, of Derrida. And this is what I was saying, you know, earlier about, you know, let's say the response of, say, someone like Chomsky, who calls something gibberish uh, because they don't understand it. I mean, the point is for, you know, for whatever we're reading as students of literature, um, you know, we un understand first, criticize later. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, and I, this is uh, what I like, uh, about the statement at the, at the, at the conclusion, I was, I'm not really sure about how to think about this. And that, that kind of uh, acknowledgement of um, uncertainty in one reading the text is, you know, humility is required. And so understanding is hard. Working on figures like Freud and Derrida is hard. So you have to work at it. You come to an understanding, uh, but, but be careful about judging before you understand. And I see that happen a lot in the case of Freud and Derrida both as a kind of a knee-jerk reactionary negation, pr uh, prejudicial in a bad sense, uh, negation of their thought without having really done the work of understanding uh, the, the texts that, that are being presented to us. And I think if, as you dig deeper into the thought of Freud, you might find that there are a lot of, you know, more, there are a lot more nuances here than strike you at first uh, a glance, and I would just continue. I would just urge you to continue working on on these texts and doing your best to understand them. Okay, um, now let's let's turn our attention here. This is the last sort of cluster of questions here. The question of Derrida and motherhood. There were quite a few that uh, of you that, that that responded to these lectures that wrote about this one. I'll just read a few of these statements that I picked out. Uh, explicate Derrida's statement, today's teaching establishment perpetuates a crime against life understood as the living feminine. Disfiguration disfigures the maternal tongue. Okay, this is um, the quote that um, Derrida says in Ear of the Other uh, in his Deconstruction of the University. Now, what I understood from this part was that dead, that what is dead is the masculine, the living is feminine, which I don't really get. I know that many cultures hold women feminine in relation to life because we women create 
uh, birth and life. But beyond that, I just don't know. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Here's another one. Uh, in Derrida's theory, I had a hard time understanding what was meant by the mother being just as much a construct as the father is. The father has to be constructed uh, uh, to the child because the act of procreation occurs before the child is around, whereas the mother can be empirically sensed. Uh, but how is it that the mother is just as much a falsehood? If the father is uh, spirit heard but not seen, and the mother is specter, uh, seen but not heard. What is meant by the mother uh, not being seen? Is this an allusion to, uh, does this allude to patriarchal marriage dynamics? Okay. And then here's another uh, response. Although at first difficult to read, I slowly begin to understand the ethical undertaking of deconstruction. For example, I had an almost visceral reaction to Derrida's description of identifying motherhood as a social construction or a legal fiction. Following his line of inquiry, it seems readily apparent, even obvious, that someone born of a female is the child of that female. In other words, she is the mother of said child. Now I ask myself, why would this be problematic? When I look around in nature and observe female dogs with the litter of puppies, I do not think the mother is socially constructed. Similar to birds, uh, deer, or cat, why should humans be any different, okay? Now, again, uh, this is, uh, so I'm just going to briefly put this in the context of what we've already said. If, if the mother were, were not a social uh, construction, that would imply that the mother would be like, you know, Alethea, who, dis, who unconceals her essence to Parmenides when he comes to the, you know, clearing in, in, in the woods, or like the Magi who stand around the Christ child who, who becomes a kind of an epiphany of, uh, of, of illuminating, you know, light and the quiditas, you know, shines forth. Um, to say that the mother is not, you know, a natu is not natural, um, you know, it's not to say that, that the mother doesn't, you know, birth uh, the children. It's simply to say, you know, much like, again, Saussure's idea of, of the uh, signified that, it, you know, in Derrida's, you know, deconstruction of that, that if, if we want to think about what the mother is, you know, we, we're going to have to do it in, in, in discourse. Uh, we can't just, or, or like, as I was talking about with Chomsky and the Democratic, we can't just sit there and say, oh, it just, you know, it is. We, we, have to, we, have to, we have to talk about the maternal. And in fact, Derrida's point is that it's always been this way. We've always, uh, the mother has always been a matter of discursive uh, construction because the mother, like the proper name, I think the mother. What is the mother? First of all, well, it is it is it is a sign. It, it exists in discourse, and it, it's the mother is the mother because the mother is not the sister. The mother is the mother because the mother is not the father. The mother is the mother because it's not, you know, uh, the daughter. And so the mother, or like the chess piece on the chessboard, we we only know the mother negatively in terms of what the mother isn't. Okay. Now, uh, so when we when we observe the process of um, of of the child being born, uh, you know, we, we have to, we, there's no way that we have access to what we are observing except insofar as it is uh, mediated through language for for Derrida. So again, we don't know things uh, as things in themselves. Things truth doesn't disclose itself to us as such, uh, but rather. Um, uh, we, we, we know things uh, differentially in, in relation to other things that we, you know, don't know. So, so we, we compare what we know to something uh, else rather than imagining, again, like, like the primitive man sitting with his potato and says, this is a raw potato. He, he can't know that it's a raw potato unless he knows what, you know, it isn't, which is to say it's not a, you know, cooked uh, potato. Okay. So, um, but let me, I, I've, I've got an example here that might, that, that I'm pulling out from Freud's writing that might help us to think about this. Um, so let me, let me, uh, this, this is a reading from, uh, this is a, a quote from Freud from his Medusa's head, which I think can help us to understand the idea of what say Lacan is going to, when Lacan describes the phallus as a kind of a transcendental signifier, um, this this might help us to get at what we're talking about in terms of truth not disclosing itself to us as such, but only negatively in comparison with other signs and systems of signification. Okay, so here's Freud. To decapitate equals to castrate. 
the terror of Medusa's decapitated head. Remember, Medusa is a woman in Greek mythology who um, Perseus cuts off her head and uh, holds it up and causes the Gorgon to uh, turn to stone. And anybody that looks at Medusa's head gets, uh, or Medusa's, you know, gets turned into stone. She has snakes growing out of her head. Okay. Um, all right. So to decapitate equals to castrate. The terror of Medusa's decapitated head is thus a terror of castration that is linked to the sight of something. Numerous analyses, Freud says, have, been, have made us familiar with the occasion for this. It occurs when a boy who has hitherto been unwilling to believe the threat of castration catches sight of the female genitals, probably those of an adult surrounded by hair and essentially those of his mother. The hair upon Medusa's head is frequently represented in works of art in the form of snakes, and these once again are derived from the castration complex. It is a remarkable fact that however frightening they may be in themselves, they nevertheless serve actually as a mitigation of the horror, for they replace the penis, the absence of which is the cause of the horror. Okay, this is again Freud's famous theory of castration anxiety. This is a confirmation of the technical rule according to which a multiplication of penis symbols signifies castration. The sight of Medusa's head makes the spectator stiff with terror, turns him uh, to stone, for becoming stiff means an erection. Thus, in the original situation, it offers a consolation to the spectator. He is still in possession of a penis, and the stiffening reassures him of the fact. And for Freud, again, to display the penis or any of its surrogates is to say, I am not afraid of you. I defy you. I have a penis. All right. Well, OK, let's let's think about this for uh, for just a minute. So the Medusa uh, and, 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 and a wonderful essay, if you haven't read it, you know, Helene Sixou's Laugh of the Medusa, it's canonical text that, that all students of critical theory should uh, should, should read. Uh, but there again, she she observes, as does Freud, that the Medusa is a symbol of of, of the female genitals or or of of the vagina, uh, and so the 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 child in this case in Freudian's theory uh, in Freud's uh, theory, they can think of think of castration as a mitigated form of um, I think of a circumcision that is as a mitigated form of castration, or it's a symbolic form of castration. The the prohibition we could say literally is that the, is that the father cuts the head of the foreskin off of the penis and it traumatizes the child, but it also instills in the child a sense of anxiety that let's say, if I don't obey the law, the next time when dad comes around, he's going to come for the whole thing. Right. And so he, you know, he, he fears, you know, he, he, he carries in his unconscious for Freud, the trauma of having been, you know, cut on his penis by the father during the act of uh, circumcision. And so, this this reinforces his uh, willingness again to uh, to 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 uh, obey the law to follow the, the prohibitions you know of of the father and so for in the Freud's thinking when the male child catches a glimpse of his mother's genitals he thinks oh my God well there's proof that if I don't obey what happened uh, to her could happen you know to me the whole thing could be uh, taken from me it could be it could be cut off and so. Um, and so uh, he, the child, the, the getting of, of the erection is sort of the stiffening of, of the penis is like, oh, well, there is, there is a there there. All right. And then so there, there is something that is there after all. OK, now for, for Lacan, when he th when Lacan thinks of the phallus as a privileged you know, signifier, transcendental signifier, because it's, it's like in this Freudian sense, it's a symbol of presence. It, it, it it's a thinking of of like well it's like like the Christ child in the manger with the quiditas or you know Alethea in in the, uh, the disclosure who discloses you know herself to Parmenides in the opening there is something that is you know there is some there that is there and, and let's say this uh, this quiditas whatness this essential sense this belief then that the, the phallus then becomes in this sense associated with the thereness of the there or with this idea of metaphysics of presence. It is not absent. It, it becomes thought of as a presence. And so the phallus or the scepter becomes a kind of a symbol of this, this privileged uh, sign in a discursive sense. Okay. But now 
if you just think about it for a moment, this is of course comical uh, because there is, there is no there, there. All right. Now in Derrida's essay on choreographies, he says the same thing about hymen, uh, which is the veil, you know, uh, over the uh, vagina or the, 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 in a choral sense is that he says that there that is that there, you cannot attribute existence to the hymen. All right. Now his point is, is that you can't attribute for Derrida, you cannot attribute existence to the hymen, but you also cannot attribute existence to the phallus. In both cases, this is illusory, all right? That, that uh, again, we only know things negatively. There is, truth doesn't disclose itself to us as such. This is true of the phallus. This is true of the mother. Uh, this, this, this is a, a basic deconstructive uh, uh, truth, um, is that is, is the truth, we know things in terms of difference, or difference, differing and deferring. Okay, now, all right, so we're, we're coming to the conclusion of this. Um, and again, let me just uh, reiterate, I mean, one might be Thomas, uh, like, like uh, many you know, Catholics today remain you know, Thomas in their thinking and say, no, look, you know, Christ did disclose his essence to us as, as a child, that this event did happen, it did uh, uh, occur. I'm th think of, for instance, in the case of, of the in the biblical sense, when you know when when Jesus uh, was reading the, uh, uh, the 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 Torah in, in in the early you know temple, uh, you know when he was you know still a young man, and he said he simply shut the Torah and said, "I'm you know I I am the Word. I I am I am uh, you know I'm I am the meaning of the text." Well, he made his he made his fellow. Uh, uh, his, his uh, compa he made the, 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 those worshiping so angry that he chased him out of town, throwing you know uh, rocks at him. Now, now uh, that is 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 a matter of, of belief, okay? And 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 one might you know believe that, but it, again, it's, it wouldn't be a matter of, of empirical truth. It would be a matter of what somebody you know uh, believes. Uh, and for Derrida, who's not a, a Christian but Jewish, this is not something that he. Uh, uh, believes. Um, so again, our goal here is is not to. Uh, is, we, there's no conversionary agenda here. We're, we're simply trying to understand the thinking of Derrida. And I think that when when you get to specters of Marx, when you think about, we don't we know nothing. Uh, we don't know anything. You know, we don't know truth as such. We only know things negatively. Keep this in mind when you when you're reading Derrida's deconstruction of uh, of Marx, because I think it'll prove. To be useful to you okay so we're going to conclude on that uh on that note and uh, uh so uh that's all for uh for today